Okay, so yeah, welcome to uh, April 2021 energy meeting. Uh, we're thrilled to have Matt Harbison here to uh, talk about his giant Orion mosaic. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, that guy over in Finland had a cool mosaic, and then I saw yours. I was like, oh, cool, somebody dwarfed him. So that's nice. But so Matt lives in Chattanooga, and uh, you know, John and he go back, but uh, he's an avid astronomer astro imager and uh, he's also a past president of the club over there so he's been uh, been doing this for a while but today he's going to talk about the 200 panel mosaic he did over five years yep yeah. and and hopefully we can keep up with him thank you matt oh no thank you uh if you, you like that okay let us know if you can't share the desktop okay. yeah i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick So um, <clears throat> I've been doing versions in, of this program for about two to three years now. And I just add as I get through the process and uh, I kind of, part of me really wondered if I would really get through, if I would, if I would finish, <laughs> you know, when you start something this, this, this massive, um, there's a little bit of, you gotta, you gotta be able to not think about it. You know, um, it's like catch 22. It's that whole you know, uh, if, if you want to leave, then you should probably stay. And if you want to stay, you definitely got to go. <laughs> and, and that's a, that's a lot like, um, astrophotography. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of disciplines that, that you got to bring to the table. Just looking at this image here, of, um, of my telescope on there. Uh, this was, uh, actually the first, uh, season I imaged in marathon, uh, from their pads, um, and I'll get to that in a second, but um, I have my 1100 there set up uh, with a William Optics 132 and a QHY 16200 camera, which was the camera that I used for my mosaic. Um, I bought the camera in 2015 and um, I used the camera all the way through 2017 um, and then I kind of switched up a little bit, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to... Um, I really want to an answer the question of why embark upon something so large as an, as an amateur. And, and um, so I have, um, I've got a couple steps that uh, I'm going to walk you through and then answer some questions and try to be a little more technical than I normally am. Um, so uh, first of all, you know, as an astrophotographer, we all love getting that shot. And uh, this is a single image from, from Marathon. Um, people ask me all the time, uh, is that stacked? And no, that's just one image. It's, it's really ridiculous what a Bortle one sky will do for you. Um, and, um, again, one shot and people ask me, how do you get, how did you get that shot? Well, you know, just with, as with anything in astrophotography, you have to plan your shot. You know, this shot, uh, the motel sign was on for a, probably less than a second. And then the image tracked all the way through. Uh, for another, I think I tracked it for 120 seconds after um, it did the one second of light on the motel sign. So I got that beautiful uh, lighted sign, lit sign, and it's throwing the light on the on the bush there. But if you really zoom in, you can see that there's movement in the background. Um, but it, it the light was enough to imprint upon the image. And of course, there's the Milky Way in all its glory out there. This was actually uh, with my society um, at Russell Cave, Alabama. We throw, uh, we're in, the, Chattanooga is, if you're not familiar with the area, we have Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia, so we're the Tri-Cities. Um, and then North Carolina is not too far from us. And um, we try to, we cater to kind of that, those whole areas. We have members in North Carolina, we have members in, in, um, in, in Georgia, we have members in Alabama and Tennessee. But this was, um, I don't know if you remember when um, the ISS was doing the spot the station deal, uh, but we, I took, I snapped this shot um, and I, very much by accident. Uh, my camera, the, the shutter, um, actually the battery died um, as the ISS was coming over. It ended up taking a 10 minute image, but it also got all the lightning bugs in it. And um, so it, it was a, it was a nice image. Um, this is Chattanooga and our beautiful Bortle 25 skies. And 
you can see that wonderful soupiness that we have in, um, over our river. Um, this is actually a conjunction of the moon. Um, and the three stars you see in the sky there uh, are Jupiter, Saturn, and, and I want to say that one of them is Mars, uh, but it could be I could be wrong. Um, it was this is from probably 2015, 16. Another image just out with a DSLR and my camera. Another one, and these kind of photos. I took these for years, 2009 up until about 2013, when I started thinking, you know, I should probably buy a telescope and um, I should probably put a camera on it. Um, I've always been a photographer. I was on my school. Um, uh, I did uh, photography in, in college, and uh, and it kind of stuck with me. And my dad was a photographer, and uh, I've gotten big trouble one time because I used a whole roll of 3,200-speed camera film on his A1 trying to take a picture of the moon, and I just took blurry <laughs> white smears. Um, so I, I guess I could say I've been doing astrophotography since uh, high school, but I don't I don't know that that's fair. Um, and I, I really had this love affair with Orion, and I won't bore you with the details. You can go to my website and read the backstory on the project of why I got to it. Um, but I love star trails, and I loved looking at the sky. I loved Orion. There were I have these bucket list shots that are just they're in my head, and I I'm one of those people who um, I'm I'm a big picture guy. And so I realize that sometimes um, <clears throat> to be a big picture guy or a big picture person, uh, you have to figure out exactly where you got to be and when. And uh, that's not, that's definitely a usable skill in astrophotography. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But um, as I moved around and took these wide field shots, I really got enamored with deep sky photography. And so I threw a 16200 camera on a, a, actually it was a 383 for a, uh, three or four years on a on my William Optics 132 and and really enjoyed learning that camera and then I moved to the 16200 which really is kind of the same camera in terms of sensor um, in terms of sensor quality its noise uh, patterns and um, what you can expect out of the camera but I've had quite a bit of success with um, astrophotography and um, several covers of magazines and you know, people ask me all the time, um, why, why do you do astrophotography? And uh, for me, it's really showing people what, what, what's out there. The thought of one of these stars being somebody else's son really does hit home with me. It really um, inspires me to, to kind of open people's eyes. Most of these photos you see here are mosaics. I, um, I, I really set out to get, I couldn't with my, with my Attic 383 um, and its massive eight megapixels, I couldn't really get the resolution I wanted. So the only way to do that is, of course, to mosaic it. Now, <clears throat> when when we were talking earlier about some of the astro uh, astronomy programs and actually the uh, consolidating programs, they've gotten better over the years. But uh, as I began to get into mosaics, there wasn't a lot offered out there, and uh, so it was kind of tough to find a program that would that would put them together. And and so I kind of ha had to hobble some of those things together um, to figure that out. Now, on the left here of Orion, this is the first mosaic of Orion I shot. This is actually a 12 panel mosaic with a Canon 100 lens and an Attic 383 camera uh, monochrome. And I shot uh, hydrogen luminance, red, green and blue. Uh, and then on the right here, you have uh, another hydrogen and actually oxygen in this one, red, green, and blue and luminance from my 16200 and my, um, my William Optics 132. Um, and uh, four years difference there. This was, the again, the first mosaic of Orion that I set out to capture. And when I finished it, I was happy with it, but I, I, you, know, you just can't zoom into this thing. You know, it is what it is. There's your image. Uh, <clears throat> one of the tricks with mosaics is that <clears throat> you have to set it up beforehand. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You have to really get familiar with sky angle. You have to get familiar with um, your, your rotation on your camera. Excuse me. Um, and I, I actually purchased a rotator for this, for the, just this reason. Sorry. But initially... What I was doing, um, I figured out the circumference of my 
um, my, um, it's a tube at the back of my focuser. And my friend and I, um, we found somebody to print on vinyl a degree, uh, um, st a sticker with the degrees that we could easily rotate to. So we knew where the sky angle was. And, and if it stays on your mount, you know, if you're fortunate enough, just put it, pull it out in the driveway. I have a, um, uh, JMI or not, I have actually a scope buggy. Um, and, uh, I bought that thing way too late. Uh, I'm, I'm, there's a couple things in astrophotography that I always say, gosh, you, that's worth its weight of, in gold. And, and a scope buggy is one of those things. If you thought I would like a scope buggy, then you should have bought one two or three years ago because it will save your back. So, uh, I push mine right out these double doors and, and, and go an image in the driveway all the time. And, it's been a back saver for me. Um, <clears throat> but there's a couple things along the way you kind of figure out like how this works in terms of rotating things and moving things. Uh, and so what I want to do tonight is I just want to quickly go through 10 steps to success in, a, in a, um, a, a giant mosaic. And maybe it doesn't even need to be giant. Um, you can do a mosaic with, you know, five or six panels. I actually uh, put a mosaic out today that I just finished that I've worked on the last two months. It's just, it's, it's actually one panel. It's 1.2 panels. I shot two panels next to each other because it just made sense to shoot it the way I was familiar with. So the degree is, is much larger than, than um, it appears. But then I cropped it <laughs> the way I wanted it. You can go to my website and see what I did. But um, it's only 1.2 panels of a mosaic. It's not two panels of a mosaic. Uh, but framing is a big part of it. You know, as you present this, sky the portion of the sky that you see um, I want people to to be able to for it to click this is what I'm looking at so um, I'll show you the image a, a little bit later of the of the spaghetti nebula I'm, I'm referring to but um, I'm going to start from the beginning so 10 steps to success these are things that I kind of learned along the way so number 10 is probably the easiest one it's master your equipment and I would just say uh Whatever you start out on, um, I've, of course, here's an 1100 GTO, which is, it, it is an end game mount. You know, you buy one of these, you never buy another mount. Uh, it is extremely heavy, but uh, my, my 1100, it is a, it's a wonderful mount. And it, it, it is uh, below 0.5 arc seconds every night. I mean, it's, it guides like nobody's business and, and it does its thing. It just, it truly, that, that old, um, that old sky and telescope article and the review where it says it just, it fades away. That's exactly what it does. You even forget that you have a mount with an astrophysics mount because it just works. Um, but these days there's so many great alternatives out there the, you know, Celestron CGXL is a great mount these days. The, uh, the Skywatcher EQ six R pro is probably the best mount out there. Hands down. I, I would, I would say um, it, and the cost is so, I mean, it's, it's affordable in terms of, what you're getting, you're getting a quality mount. Um, and now I will say this, astrophysics mounts are amazing, but they sound like a bean grinder. Whereas those nice new Skywatcher uh, EQR6 Pros, they're nice and quiet. Um, so equipment is part of the thing. You've got to learn your equipment. You can do that in the driveway. You're not going to be able to shoot a mosaic without understanding what kind of equipment you have, because you've got to understand things like degree angles, you got to understand things like um, ap aperture and, and how fast you're shooting, uh, pixel scale. Um, when I do these talks, people always ask me, uh, does that mean you can take an image from three different cameras with different, uh, with different properties and, and mosaic it together? Yeah, you probably can, uh, but you're going to get all kinds of, of, of weird noise and and places where it just doesn't really fit together. So in my opinion, the best way to proceed for mosaics is probably um, to, to, to stay at the same pixel uh, size and, and across the pixel scale across the board. And that's what I did with my mosaic in Orion. Um, so my initial mosaic of Orion that you saw earlier, that was right around, I think 12 megapixel or 12, the pixel scale is around 12. Um, whereas my pixel scale of my 200 panel mosaic it's actually 1.7. So here's my 1100 with my 132 on it. You see my 16200 in there. You actually see uh, my rotator. You see a moonlight rotator and focuser. Um, and this has the this is the old belt rotator, but it worked wonderfully. Uh, this system 
you know, I, I'll stand by this system all day long. It was a beautiful scope. The FLT-132 William Optic scope, I think as far as like deep sky scopes, it's one of the best for the money. You can put a 268 on this thing and it, it'll, it, it will just make beautiful images. And my stars were pinpoint, uh, beautiful star pattern. Um, if I had any complaints, I'd say it was just a tad bit sensitive to blue, but you know, I, you can work around that. Um, it was a beautiful scope, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful scope. Um, <clears throat> repeatability. Whatever, after you figure out your equipment with your mount and your telescope and your camera, you're going to have to be able to do the same thing every time quite often. Now, <clears throat> I say that for this reason. As you start to mosaic things, as you, as you figure out where you go in the sky, the next time you go back, you either have to go back to that exact same point or you have to start a couple of degrees away from that or maybe not even, maybe less than a degree away from that. Because of that, I would suggest finding a program that will actually allow you to mosaic. Now, I know Nina does that these days. It'll allow you to plan mosaics. I've always used Sequence Generator Pro. Um, Ken and, um, and, and Jared um, are fantastic folks and have helped us tremendously. Uh, and, you know, I would talk to Jared and say, it would be really nice if it did this. And it, and, and two weeks later, it would do that. Um, so uh, I kind of plug SGP for their framing and mosaic wizard, because when that came out in 2016, 17, it was a game changer for me. I was so happy because before I had these, I had these journals that I, I sketch in, you know, like at, from astronomy with my Dob. I would sketch a target. Well, in the back of those journals, I started writing down the RA and deck and a star right in the center of the field. And then what I would do is figure out how far that was. I'd get Sky Safari Pro and I'd find that star and I'd find, I'd overlay it over it. And I, I took a little piece of paper and I drew the image circle. But this was before Sky Safari <laughs> added those sorts of things. And I kind of figured out exactly where to, to put the next panel. Um, and then, of course, I would put it together and use um the the mosaic properties of pix insight to put the image together to see how well it went together but that was that was with that's pre the 12 panel mosaic on the 383 to do a 200 panel mosaic it's got to be perfect every time and and they got and and uh they really got that going really in 2016 with uh, sgp and and that was the that was the key but here you see me going out and and um this is with several other members of the Astronomical Society, Ralph McConnell and Dennis Sprinkle and David Frost. And uh, I think Dennis actually owns the, the middle two scopes there. And that's me on the left. Um, the, uh, the other big piece of it, of course, is, is not just the equipment, but the software. And um, once you start talking about repeatability, you got to know, you know, how things are working with your software. You got to know, where it works. This is my guiding graph on my graph on my 1100. You can see it's not a great star, uh, but you can also see that <laughs> that the 1100 um, it it produces. <laughs> it does its thing. Um, and learning how to use SGP and and guide and and then put panels together. It's all part of it. Now you can see just at the bottom of the of the screen here. You see the new horsehead six panel. Two. That's initially where my mosaic started. As I started working on mosaics and put it working on the mosaic and putting it together, and I was mastering and I was working on this equipment. Um, I actually uh, I would I would line them up and I would shoot them in in order, and then I would go and I would mosaic them through the gradient merge mosaic tool in Photoshop, just the luminance channel, to ensure that I I'd, I'd done it properly. And then you get in the habit of learning how to check your data to make sure everything lines up. Um, you don't want to go and shoot uh, one panel and then realize uh, that the rotator didn't work or you forgot to rotate and you shot half of it portrait where it should have been landscape. Uh, but that happens. And, and I would, you know, I, my mosaic was a total of 192 panels. That's what's printed um, at the end. However, I shot a total of 280 something panels and I threw out that many because um, once I once I created the 209 panel mosaic, it was too long and it wasn't centered. So I cropped it and it ended up being 192. But I I didn't 
I didn't split hairs. I just called it a 200 panel mosaic because I shot way more than that. But I threw a lot of panels out because of problems uh, where something didn't plate solve and go back to the exact same place. Um, I would throw out that data. And then also you got to consider location. Um, if you're going to do a big project, you probably want a pretty dark sky. So I would go to Cloudland Canyons or Fall Creek Falls, both of which are probably about a Bortle four, maybe maybe a three. Fall Creek Falls might be a three, um, but but definitely a four. Um, and and that's where I would start my mosaic. Now I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but you can see on my 1100 here. At this point, I have gone full crazy. And I have purchased an, an, another 132 uh, William Optics telescope and another 16200 camera because I was so I was so dedicated to finish this mosaic. I mean, I can't even tell you. I, I if it was if it was clear and it was a work night, I would still drive up to Fall Creek Falls, which is about an hour drive from Chattanooga. I would get on Target. Um, I would start it up and I would sleep in a in in that clam you saw that was an ice fishing tent earlier you saw I would sleep in there and then get set the alarm for four o'clock um, and then I would pack it all up and I would drive back to Chattanooga take a shower and go to work um, and that's what it took and I did that for about two and a half years before something really magical happened this is some of my work on this mosaic here you see the color data I was collecting out in Fall Creek Falls, and it's all good data. Um, uh, <laughs> I joke, you become the butt of all jokes. People are like, hey, Matt, what are you imaging tonight? <laughs> Ryan, right? Um, it, it's like everybody wants to laugh at you. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I guess I guess it is a funny thing. I spent all this time shooting it. But here you can really see the the rig doing its thing. This is the two 132s and the, the 1100, and it pushed it easily. I shot a total of about 50, 55, 56 panels of my 200 panel mosaic with this setup. Now, there's probably, I think it, originally I'd said it was 75, but I ended up throwing out about 40 of those panels just because uh, when you're traveling, sometimes data, you miss it. You don't, you don't, you know, you're out at night, you're packing up. The nice thing about going to Marathon which is they really cater to astrophotographers. They have pads there um, and they have power uh, outlets and, and Wi-Fi and Ethernet cords so that you can plug in and uh, you can even take a Wi-Fi camera there, point it at your scope and go to bed and just put a monitor. I put my iPad next to the bed and just look over at it. And it was wonderful. And um, you can actually see on this one image on the right, you can see that, that uh, the... Uh, the vinyl sticker I was talking about earlier that allowed me to rotate. I only had one rotator, uh, man, or electric rotator is on the left scope, um, but I could repeat it simply by unlocking it and moving it to the same degree. So you see both scopes doing their thing here uh, in Marathon. So this was a place we went to just as a group from the Astronomical Society of Chattanooga. There's six, three of us loaded up in a car and went down there for, to try it out and look and image in those Bortle One skies, and we were blown away. And we built a relationship with those folks, and we went out five or six times before uh, the most amazing thing happened, and, and that would be that they invited us to come and move into the observatory that they were building. And here you see my data. This is, um, this is my data I'm pulling down on both, both, both images here. Uh, this is what my computer looked like when I was using both scopes. Um, I, number five, I've got race against the clock, and that's because uh, you learn when you're doing a mosaic, you, you make every minute count. Um, even if you don't think you need it, uh, you don't waste a minute, you know, um, if you want to finish in a, in a short amount of time. And the other trick to it is you literally, you, you get tired. And so you really, you need to understand your patience. If you're not a very patient person, I don't think I'd recommend going all in on a 200 panel mosaic. Now, if you're, if you're a patient person and you can deal with things and roll with punches, then go for it. Because the challenge, I mean, it's immense. But I got to tell you, uh, I, I get lost in my mosaic to this day. I mean, I spend, I'll sit uh, at night, I'll, I'll, my wife will be reading, I'll be on my iPad scrolling through my mosaic. Um, I love it. <laughs> the thought that I, I never will look at Orion the same way again, uh, again in my life. But you race the clock. Uh, you're really trying to outrun yourself because you're, you don't realize this, but you're, you're getting tired 
And you'll get to the point where you just say, I quit. I'm not going to do it anymore. I walked away from this mosaic twice and had friends tell me, go back, finish it. And I'm glad I did. Here you can see uh, both, both cameras, uh, both scopes running. Uh, back when I got started, I called it the plan. I had this big name for it. I mean, I'm always, uh, even when I finished it, I called it the Orion Project. Somewhere about halfway through when I moved to Orion, I started telling people, yeah, I'm working on this big Orion project. And, you know, people will be like, what? <laughs> does, that, does that look with NASA? I'm like, no. Um, but you can see how I've got it all set up. You can see in the, in the target list, you can see everything lines up. So I would shoot red and green on one scope and blue and um, luminance on the other one. Or actually what I do is shoot blue and green and red and luminance. Um, and I would roll through everything. I would let one, sky, one, one telescope would guide and the other one would just simply uh, take photos and I would have it, I had it set for pauses. So it would pause and wait for it. There was no way for, QHY didn't have a way for it to tell the other scope or the other camera, hey, wait while I take this this calibration image or while the guider corrects. So what I had to do was put a bit of a delay in there so that it would download properly and then give it a second to calibrate. And one night, it, it never worked out where it was perfect. Um, I would always have to go back and kind of, um, I would have more images on one scope than I would have on the other. But you can see the plan coming together. I'm well into panel 32 here. And you can see I'm chipping away as I go through. I'm adding data. Um, and I'm plate solving. My big thing was, I don't want to just do a mosaic and line them up in Photoshop. I want this thing plate solved. And um, you can see uh, you truly learn patience during this thing because you, you'll get a set of data that just doesn't stack up, but you want it to work because you want to finish that panel. You can see at the top left up here, uh, all that both of those panels got thrown out because they did not plate soft correctly and they're not, they should be in quadrants and they should fit a quadrant and they don't. So they got through out, thrown out. Um, here is uh, the panels lining up. Now, this is how I would line them up in uh, S or in picks inside as I would go just to make sure I was getting them all. And this kind of became the way that I would go through and make sure I had the panel early on. I would line it up and make sure it was there in picks in sight. Um, and then I would go through and I would save it to a folder with the correct name. Um, but I would always leave, I, would, I kept notes. I would write down the original file name uh, and then I would, I would put a separate file name in my notes. So it's kind of like the master key. So you can always go back and, um, and, file, and, and find the file you need. I, at this time, in my head, I thought, you know, I'm not going to rename the master files because I think the master files need to stay the same name or I'll get confused. I'll name them something improper. And I realized that was the correct way to go. However, I, I did something stupid. I moved them out of the original folders and put them into new folders. The correct names. I should have never done that because um, when you do that, you break some of that. You break some of the consistency of where things go in terms of nights. Um, you can correct this with SGP's naming um, functions. So just be aware when you see those key features and the naming sequence that you can make, um, that's there for a reason. That's there to keep you organized. And you can see I'm starting to get into Barnard's loop here. Um, find things in the field of you, the field of view folks didn't know were there. Um, I always love that when you find something, people are like, I didn't know that was there. You know, I didn't realize that was that close. Um, that's kind of like the waterfall over there under the Orion Nebula. Um, lots of people are like, well, I didn't realize that. So here you can see um, I had finished the, the 46 panel mosaic on the right. And I just needed to shoot those, those, um, I think that's uh, 15 panels on the left there. And I didn't finish it in that season. I had to wait a season to get through that. That's really heartbreaking when that happens. Here you see, they just built the observatory in Marathon and, uh, and they let me put my telescope in there. Of course, it didn't stay there. Um, there weren't even any peers in there yet. Um, and I brought my stuff and set it up and Looks like I camped out in there, but I didn't. Um, and I imaged, that's the observatory right there facing the, uh, the mountains. And um, as you can see, nothing back there, nice and dark. This gentleman in the center there, that's Bill Ramey. He is the observatory director 
and uh, Marathon Mario Sky Park. And the gentleman on the left there is Dennis Sprinkle, the famous Dennis Sprinkle. Dennis is uh, – he's about the smartest guy you will ever meet. Um, by the time you ask the question, Dennis has already figured it out. He's a super smart guy. And you can see Dennis's system is right behind him on the right, on his right. And over my left shoulder, that's my system. And uh, all the wires are ran along the bottom and into that. So I was invited into the Marathon Observatory. And uh, so Dennis uh, and I installed our machine, our telescopes in there. And then I, and then it really got fun because I was chewing through data like you wouldn't believe. And really things just kind of took off. I never in a million years would have thought that that mosaic would have gotten me in in uh in in texas but there were folks there who wanted to see me finish it and so i was invited to come in there it was fantastic um i think this is the install so this is this is when we installed my pier so we uh, we made the pier here in chattanooga we put it in the car drove it 22 hours to texas and you see we're moving stuff all around there putting it on putting it up taking it off making sure it doesn't hit the roof and you would think well you should measure that before you go and we did we did um but you never know how far your adjustment's going to be and what it's going to look like on the bottom. And is it going to be level? Um, and exactly are there anything that you haven't accounted for? And then you got to think about the angles when it's straight overhead. And here you can see us, we were testing things and just making sure uh, stuff lined up. You can see us out. We would come out, let it, uh, we we're running. Um, I think I was, because I can't see the, I can't see Polaris here. Um, in the image. So what I would have to do um, is um, I would have to drift a line. And so we used uh, software to do that, figure that out. And it would have to run for about three hours and it would make corrections. And then you would tell you to how to correct it and you would correct it. You see a storm off in the side there. And so we did that, um, installed it. And I finally got out the Beetlejuice and you can see, um, you, you guys can see the checkerboard on the right side, can't you? Yes. Just a nod. Anybody? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. You you can't see my my imp, the the camera the views over on the right, can you? Is that blocking your way? Uh, not past Rigel, I don't see very much. Okay. Okay. So you can see um, I am I am making my way through the center. That's about ninety one panels, and I um, as I would go through and mosaic and put it together. Um, there's the center parts and. Um, you can see there's a tiny little comet over there. I think it's Lovejoy over there hanging out on the right. Uh, we put an all sky camera in the observatory so we could watch it. And here's the video of, of the install. Hopefully there's some audio here. And yeah, maybe no audio. Can y'all hear audio? No, I don't hear anything. Uh, well, that's a bummer. Well, you could kind of you see it doing its thing there, and I realized real quick I was working on a potato can, potato computer. <laughs> if you ever feel like your computer's just not up to snuff, um, that's how I felt uh, as I started working on this giant mosaic. So at this point, I'm probably around 225 panels. You can see SGP had at the time about a 40, 50 panel limit on how much you could put into the framing mosaic wizard. So what I had to do was work on corners at a time to overlap them. When you're setting up a mosaic, you're gonna be allowed to uh, overlap by your designated percentage. So if you wanna say, I'm gonna overlap 10%, 15%, and depending on your field of view, you can make those decisions. And then from there, um, you put it into a sequence and you just really mark off the numbers. And, and that's what I did. Now, I love uh, this Beetlejuice, I loved my William Optics because it really just, uh, it had a beautiful star pattern. And if you just let it sit there, it would, it would just, it would starburst with the best of them. So this was when I first shot Beetlejuice and this is when it dimmed and I went back and shot. Now, I think this was only, uh, I didn't put as much integration in this one because it's probably, so it's probably not a fair, uh, a fair comparison, but it's close. And you can definitely see the luminosity is there's a different def, definite difference there um, because the field is about the same. If you align the stars there, they see the two stars there, you can see the difference. Um, and somewhere along the way, you've just got to take a step back and understand that um, 
that that you're doing this because it's fun <laughs> because it's easy to get lost in the numbers it's easy to have a bad night where your camera doesn't cool down and everything has noise in it it's easy for your flats not to work uh, and your calibration files i got in the habit of shooting calibration files uh, every other night uh, as i was doing this mosaic because uh, i noticed that little things as temperatures would shift quite often out in marathon it really wreaked havoc on the data and here's the mosaic completed uh, and you can kind of see exactly what's going on uh, this is 200 panels merged together i printed it it's actually behind me let's see if i can do this i'm gonna i'm gonna stop my share real quick just everybody hang on is that metal what's that yeah it's on it's on metal Awesome. Uh, hey, Matt, I had a quick question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, I just thought I, I bought a, a Pegasus rotator not too long ago, and I've been trying to start doing mosaics myself. In SGP, there's a selection. Um, you can auto rotate or validate rotation. What, sure. When you, when, what do you, your workflow, do you, um, do you let it automatically determine? Once you you specify the overlap, um, can you guys see me now? Can y'all put me on a bigger screen so you can see me? Yes, I I, I specify the overlap um, in SGP, so it allows okay. you to pick the overlap that you're gonna you're gonna play with. Right, but the rotation, do you validate? Do you hit, there's a tick box in the um, every time in SGP? Okay, all yep. right every time and you need to make sure there's a tricky box now they've added and it asks you as you're leaving the the framing mosaic coordinator says do you want to associate this mosaic with the sequence and you say yes because if you don't you won't be able to see the picture that you initially set up that's what that box does yeah i i know that box you're talking about yeah it's it if you miss it you're in trouble <laughs> okay there's a lot going on on the screen and it's easy to miss <laughs> That is so true. That is so true. There is. Okay. I'm trying to get back to the full view here. Give me one second. Um, oh, that's what I want. That's what I want right there. No, they don't want to leave in the meeting. Um, it looks like your uh, presentation part is frozen in mid shrink or something for the window. Yeah, that I'm trying. What I'm trying to do is um, trying to get back to um, trying to get back to the presentation. Well, maybe I'll do it at the end. Uh, can you guys see me? Yeah, it looks like we're still on that screen. Okay. Yeah, oh, there now, you're, now you're full. There you go. Okay, sorry. That took entirely too long. It shouldn't have taken that long. Um, okay, so um, let me show you this. This is what I originally want to show you. Um, so behind me, you'll see, uh, you'll see the mosaic on the wall um, right up here. So I'll kind of. So I got it hanging over my, my, my system here. That's my, this is the computer I built to work on the mosaic. Now, one of the things I did with my mosaic is I used, um, I used the, the deep zoom uh, protocols and, and software to be able to zoom in and out of my mosaic. So this is my mosaic online. And uh, here's the entire mosaic. And you can zoom all the way in uh, way down in here, and, and I can show you my favorite part of this mosaic when I put it together was right here, this little guy right here, uh, kind of hanging out. So you, you see, you can't really see that galaxy, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty nice. And then right over here, just above safe, there's this tiny little conglomerate of galaxy just kind of that are just spread apart right through here. But you can go to my website and you can look at all this stuff. It's up there, uh, it's, it's live. So you can see this anytime. Um, I'm gonna go back to the screen share and I'm gonna show you the, 
Um, I'm going to show you that last little bit. Oh, did Keynote crash? Uh, no, where'd it go? All right, there it is, okay. Okay, so um, back here. So here's the mosaic again. Um, and you see it on metal. Um, it, I, it really gathered a lot of information and you can see that link there, um, Orion 2020 v5b.spaceforeverybody.com. If you go to that br that browser location, that gets you to this giant mosaic behind me where you can scroll in and out of it all you want to. And uh, if you see behind me the screen, if you watch this, if you press Q on your keyboard, it brings up the play soft. So you can zoom in anywhere in the image and see anything you would like to see with Q. Now, um, you can also, I've been slowly but surely adding these commands. You can hit uh, R and rotate it if you don't like the way it's framed. Uh, but the Q brings up the plate solve, and that's kind of fun, um, especially when you're, especially when uh, you're uh, you're trying to find something. But the uh, the image, um, it I got an image of the day on Astro Band. Um, Reddit went crazy with it, and um, the, this the share over here on the right, the guys at OPT, whom I had spent a lot of money with over the years, uh, shared it and uh, also used it. And the SGP guys used it. Uh, the guy who did Lefty's Curves, if you're familiar with that, he uh, threw Lefty's Curve on there, which is really cool when he did it because you can see my mosaic. You can see the panels in there um, kind of laid out. Um, and then that was my Instagram post. There's a planetary nebula in there. But just all that detail, all of those nebula, all of those reflection nebula, all those things that I, I spent literally nights of my life with. I can remember what I was doing. I kept a journal of where I was and what I shot so I could go back and look at it. Um, but you do learn to appreciate the journey. And um, it's certainly been fun. Um, I actually sold the 132. I, I had two, so I kept one. I sold one and I, I just changed my whole system. Because the gentleman you saw earlier, Dennis Sprinkle and I, we bought matching systems. So we both both bought Takahashi 106 telescopes, uh, two 645 reducers, a night crawler focuser, the sidewinder tilt adjuster, the CFW3 and a QHY600. Um, and we are setting out to do a color survey of the night sky from Orion, really just that portion of the Milky Way. So we'll get started. The difference, um, so on my old system, I was at 1.7 pixel scale, um, 1.7, and, and um, my field of view is about 560 millimeter. Now I'm at uh, 3.6, uh, My or I'm at, I'm at 380 millimeters. My aperture is 3.6, and I am um, at a 1, I'm at a 1.9, 2.0 pixel scale. So I gave up a little in terms of pixel scale. But my field of view is massive. It would take me on. It would take me six of my old panels to equal one of this new system. So I have really had some fun with that. Uh, I have not enjoyed getting tilt out of it. And here is the first uh, foray into that. You can see I started at thirty-two percent tilt, which will make your day bad. Uh, and I actually, you can see the result of that tilt in this image. You see the left is really nice and. Right, not so much. And here's zero percent tilt, which I was able to finally get it to. So, just a lot of patience again. Um, this is a three-panel mosaic of the Seagull Nebula, uh, which has wings out there. Most people don't know they're there. I didn't know they were there until I found the uh, the the color surveys in Stellarium, and and uh, Dennis had tried to shoot those and and had some luck. He had a great image of it, but I. I went back and, and spent quite a bit of time. I took 30 minute subs, about 20, 30 minute hydrogen subs and oxygen subs to pull out that much detail. And this is the spaghetti nebula I just finished. It's a 1.2 2 panel mosaic. Um, I don't know if I included the entire thing in there. Well, I guess I didn't. 
Is that spaghetti nebula the same as your uh, that that rating you just showed us? The F three point six FSQ. Is that what that is? I say that again now. Yeah, I'm just looking at the spaghetti nebula there. I mean, what 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 were the optics there? Was that that from that rating you just showed us? Yeah, the Takahashi. Oh my six. God, I swear, I hate what? you. <laughs> what that so <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You know, anybody you could tell. Like, I I could tell like who really like who who is who has cried over astrophotography when I tell them what I'm using, you know, cause that's, it's, this is the end all be all for us as, as astrophotographers, you know, we want to chew through the sky as fast as we can. It's all about how good our stars look. And, you know, for me, it's all about the cut. Somebody told me in my society a long time ago that if you get the color of the stars, right, everything else falls in place. Um, if in terms of LRGB and, and they're right, but there's this game of adding hydrogen and oxygen back in and, or adding narrow band to the broadband, and that's tricky. You know, star mass, nebula masks, you got to learn those things. They're not easy. I can do them in Photoshop, and I can do them in PixInsight. Uh, and uh, the processes are, they're, they're difficult. They're not easy. Uh, but I'm, I'm always happy to show anyone that wants to see how I do it, how I do it, especially in terms of the gradient merge mosaic. I really don't have any kind of special secrets I do exactly what everybody else does. If you go to, now they've just changed in SGP, they've just changed, or not SGP, but PixInsight, they've created a new photometric color calibration or photometric uh, mosaic. And um, I, would, I would like to tell you that it's, it's great. It's, it's better than, than the original gradient merge mosaic, mosaic by coordinates, that process, but it's not on the level of APP's mosaic. Uh, processing tools. If you're going to do mosaics, uh, APP, you just throw it in there, it just does it. And it does it well. Um, I did not use APP with my mosaic simply because I'd come so far using PixInsight. I will say the PixInsight folks are really helpful. I asked several very specific questions. I asked them to figure out exactly how much memory in a computer I would need to put together my 200 pound or 200 panel mosaic. And they told me right down to the last bit. And so I built that and here we are. Um, it took it 24 hours on my new um, Threadripper 256 gigabytes of memory, uh, 10 terabyte monster computer to, to, to astrometrically solve 200 panels. Um, so it's no small feat, but I guess uh, at this point, I would say, what do you, I know you're going to have questions. What kind of questions do you have or anything specific you want to know? Like uh, the question earlier about the, the setting up the framing and mosaic wizard. Um, be real careful about your, be realistic about your field of view. Um, and always double check what you think you're taking um, compared to what image you have. Because sometimes I've, I've noticed it's not right. Like, um, especially with the overscan boxes, you can get you can get in trouble there uh, if you're losing a little bit of pixels. Um, you don't want to end up having a big black line all the way through your mosaic. Hey Matt, what do you what is your opinion with uh, percentage of overlap? What is the minimum? So that again comes down to your field of view. How big is oh, your field of view? How many stars okay. are you squeezing in there? On my 1.7, okay. 560 mil, 1.7 pixel scale, 560 millimeter scope, I was uh, I was comfortable with 15 percent. Okay, 15 I have an FLT. I, I have an FLT 132 two, uh, just one, okay. and um, um, uh, and some bigger, a few a few Zo cameras, cool cameras, but, but you were using what 20 percent. When you did that, I was using fifteen percent on my sixteen two hundred. Fifteen percent. Fifteen. Okay. Now the that, that camera is um it 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 is a I want to say it's a six. It's either a twelve megapixel or a sixteen megapixel camera. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I have bought mm -hmm. a new system since then, and I all those important numbers have flown out of my head. Um, okay. It is a. It's a 16 megapixel camera and it's, um, it's measurements um, are 
or it, the sensor size was actually uh, 23.4 millimeter by 15.8. Okay. I think that's a micro four thirds sensor. Oh, no, you're it? right. Yeah, it is. It's, it was 27 millimeter by 21.6, as opposed to an APS-C8, APS-C, which is 23.4 uh, by 15.8. So the, the APS-8 sensor was kind of the, I was thinking it would be the end game for me. And, um, and I still love the field of view of that 132. That's why I didn't sell one of them. Um, I, it's just my first scope. I probably won't ever sell it. Um, I put a 168 behind it all the time, and it takes great photos. And you used a reducer with that too, right? I did. So um, William uh, from William Optics, he, I also would say once you start doing this, once you start doing a mosaic and uh, you start showing people your work, um, they, they really want to help you. And William was so great. Uh, once I got my one scope, I called him up and said, um, you know, I got this scope I want to, I want a matching scope. And he found me a number scope, so they're very closely matched. And then um, I bought my producers the same time. Um, I went through di two different iterations of producer, uh, but the one that I, I he handpicked them for me and sent them to me, and and they were night and day. My stars were pinpoint in the corner on that ape, on the sixteen two hundred. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I think the native one thirty two is what F seven. Yes. Yeah. So it goes. I got. And I agree with you. It's a great scope. It, a, it is a fantastic. I it, hands down I think it is for the money. I it, I think it's probably the best one out there. It's hard to beat. Really hard to beat. Yeah. And and you know my my one hundred and six. It's a great scope. It has, but it's got its quirks too. The one thirty two had its quirks, and this this scope has its quirks. If you'll remember this image right here. Uh, this isn't really about tilt. This image is about chasing focus. So the image on the left is LRG, LRGB. It's 180 seconds. Uh, it's a, a, okay. It's 180 60 second photos um, per channel. So this is about 12 hours on this image on the left and 12 hours on this image on the right. The difference is the image on the left was shot at about 20 degrees Celsius, you know, nice kind of balmy, normal temperatures. And the image on the left was shot at negative five. And so I was wow. chasing focus all night. And you can see what that did to my image. Now, if you're out there imaging a mosaic, this on the right, that's going out. You can't, there's no way you're going to plate solve this. I mean, you might get lucky and plate solve it. <laughs> but when you try to, when you try to work this data back in through gradient merge mosaic, you're going to get those smush stars and things just start to look wonky. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you that my images are all perfect. If you go back through my, my catalog of, of images, I've gotten way better about it, but you're going to find some smush stars, even in my Orion mosaic, you know, there, there are places in it where I'm not, it's not perfect, but honestly, that 200 panel mosaic eight, it really did a number on me. <laughs> I needed it. It had to be finished. I had reached the end. So this one, you know, without, I kind of knew where I was going to finish on that one. I don't know where I'm going to finish doing a survey. So I think I'm just going to have fun with that. Right, Matt. So um, I guess I don't know if there anybody else has any more questions, but uh, um, you, know, you talk about that survey. How big is that going to be, that survey? I, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. We figured it out. Um, on this current system I have, if, if I shoot it at the exact same uh, pixel scale, or not pixel scale, but if I shoot it at the exact same um, imaging time, like figuring out, you know, how it relates to stops of light, light grasp, um, I could finish the Orion mosaic on my new system in 33 panels, whereas it took me 200 on the old system. It's that much... It's just that much, you know, the field of use is that much uh, larger. And then the light grasp of it, it's two stops faster. I mean, that's that's a big difference. <laughs> that's the difference. You know, I could shoot a one-minute image. That's a that's that's two-minute image. So, is that you wish you would have had something like that a long time ago? You know, I, I'm not, I, I I really don't. I really don't. It's like people ask me if I wish I would have started with the. Um, with the 200 panel mosaic and um, on the other one. And 
And no, it's, it's like, here's my theory with astrophotography. There's a certain amount of bad nights you've got to have and, and you're going to have them no matter what. So like if it's, if it's halfway decent outside and you're like, should I go out and image? Yes, you should, because you might go out and have a terrible night and you were going to have to have that terrible night. So the next night you go out, it might be really nice. And you got that terrible night out of the way. So it'll be nice. And that's just, maybe that's me being the eternal optimist, but you, you have got to understand that when you're doing a project like this, um, you got to be patient and you, you got to pay the dues. There's no, there's no easy way to do this. People ask me all the time, um, why didn't you use a 135 lens? Well, yeah, I could have done that, but um, you're still going to have to keep your data together. You're still going to have to, you know, have a good discipline and figure it out. And, and I love that you're seeing all these different mosaics coming out. There's some guys that have done way greater things than I'm doing and they're, they're doing it different ways. Uh, and everybody's going to be particular about other things. Last time I gave one of these talks, somebody kept asking me if I thought it was okay to mix pixel scale, scales. And, um, and I, I personally, my preference is no, but, but other people do it and do it successfully. So if you've got mad Photoshop skills, use them. Uh, Matt, I have a question. <clears throat> you mentioned a tilt adjuster in your, your training of things. What uh, I wasn't aware of a tilt adjuster somehow. Well, yeah. where is that in there? Okay, so if you look at this image here, you see that red focuser, that block of red aluminum there, and then you see the tube, and you've got your rings. Yeah. Between that rear ring and that red focuser, that whole black piece there um, is the sidewinder tilt adjuster, and he makes those for any scope. And um, what they do, they allow his, his and i got to tell you, I've used many tilt adjusters. Uh, this is from Moonlight, Ron Newman over at Moonlight. His sidewinder tilt adjuster it is amazing, and it's a push-pull system, so it's really easy to set back to zero. You set the scope up face down, lens down, put the, the, the tilt adjuster to it, follow the, the directions on the thing, and set it to zero. You put it back up. You take an image. You saw my images over here where I'm chasing it. This wow. is CCD Inspector, and, um, and you just take, take – you, now you got to have a star field. So you take an image, an image of the stars, and then it adjusts that. Uh, as you make adjustments, you keep taking it. And uh, as you can see, I worked it uh, all the way back to 0% tilt. Yeah. Uh, and 18.6% curvature with a giant 645 reducer that weighs about eight pounds. You need just one tilt. I mean, I have three moonlight focusers on my scopes. Uh, and I have some problems with tilt adjusting on, on one of my cameras, at least. And this yeah, you, so there's there's several manufacturers of, of tilt adjusters. Gerd Newman makes one that's really nice, and they, they come in M42 versions, M54, and maybe even an M48. And I, I think I heard they have an M63 now. But Gerd Newman makes really good products. Um, it is a little bit trickier to adjust. You can still adjust it without taking it off. But you know, like on ZWO cameras, they've got a tilt adjuster, but you got to take it off to do it. And that defeats the purpose because you need to be able to adjust it, take a picture and look. Exactly. Uh, that's so that's what Ron's does. Now, this stays in the system uh, because okay. it eats back focus. Now, I'm using a Petzl design on my on – the, on this this telescope is a Petzl design, which, which basically means it's two doublets pointed at each other. And so the focus basically reaches focus – the, the, it reaches focus basically in the back based on focus. Um, whereas uh, a, a triplet design has a light cone that it, it is very critical and that's why back focus is, is part of it. So yeah. depending on the system, you might check out the Gerd Newman one. If you said you have three uh, systems, what type of scopes are those? A uh, Stellar View 102, a Stellar View 70, and a Celestron uh, Edge 8. Okay, so um, with the edge, you don't need to do a sidewinder in that. The um, if do you have a moonlight focuser on your edge? Yes. So just talk to Ron because there's already uh, I, at least the one I have uh, had some tilt adjustment inside that focuser. Right. Uh, yeah, and it's not great, but you don't need a lot. The edge system is pretty good the way it is. Uh, I would just say be real careful with your edge. It, I've seen. I personally have owned four edge telescopes because I keep chasing the dream. <laughs> um, uh, and, and it's, 
a tilt is so crucial there. Um, it's real tricky. But for that 102, you might consider looking at a at a sidewinder. And that 70, I would I would definitely check out the Gerd Newman for that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so Matt, I was looking at uh, you know that one of the last uh, images you showed us of the uh, spaghetti nebula there, uh, and uh, uh, I saw this a little while back and had to look for it. But you had that six panel mosaic of the uh, Arita area. Uh, could you possibly go after that area next? <laughs> uh, so the way I lined it up, if you look at that Arriga, the Arriga, Arriga there, um, uh, if you look at where that's laid out. Um, so, uh, in this image, as you're looking at it, the spaghetti nebula would be, uh, I believe to the, let me double check. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, uh, it would be, yeah, it would be up to the upper right. Um, and mine is laying, um, mine is laying perpendicular to this image. So I could do it, but I, what I would probably do is I would probably lay out the mosaic as it made sense to this. Sky angle is a big part of it. When I go back and do this, I'm probably going to start my mosaic at sky angle zero. Just because you get into issues of I didn't really deal with a lot of it with my Orion mosaic because it didn't go a lot of degrees. I think it's like 30 degrees or 18 degrees wide. And, but if, if square degrees, it's, it's a larger number, of course. Um, but I'd probably stick to sky angle zero because as you start mosaicing across the, the, the field, it bows. And that's, that's, where you get into the wonky seams and that's really tricky. You see these guys like Sean Walker and the MDSW survey they're doing. Um, I have, you know, huge respect for those guys and John Gleason doing the gum and hydrogen survey. Um, super talented people who are, who have the patience of Job. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, are there any more questions? This is an awesome uh, presentation, Matt. Thank you. Helps a lot. Well, at least on my end. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank Thanks. You. Yeah. Really neat. So no, what thank you. That was awesome. So what we tend to do with these uh, these imaging means is that uh, we have uh, uh, members to show us what they've uh, come up with or the new material they may have come up with in a pre since the previous meeting from back in well, well, last month, March. And uh, so you're more than welcome to stay and uh, look over this and, and critique us as well. Uh, we got thick skins, it's okay. Anyway, uh, so, so yeah, uh, I wanna thank you so much for showing this. Uh, it's great, very informative, but uh, help me out a little bit because uh, I don't know, uh, there's only so much of the sky that's out there that's like uh, really photogenic. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely the nebulae areas that are the uh, most uh, yeah. feeling. I, I do want to show, I, I want to share something with you guys. I, I actually learned this the other day and I thought, gosh, I wish I would have learned this years ago. Um, but I figure most of you folks use Stellarium. Any of you guys use Stellarium? Guys or girls? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, just use it to generally look at, but not really plan anything. Uh, in Stellarium here, um, if you see, if you can see my screen, um, see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah. Here. Okay. There you go. How's that? You see that a little bit better? Yeah, okay. it's a little better. Uh, with Stellarium, uh, they've added this feature over the, I, I don't know when it was added, I think in the last couple months. But if you go to the sky and the viewing and, uh, portal and you go to surveys, if you go down to uh, deep sky, I think it's deep sky color. Or let's see. Is it from that guy in Spain? Oh. DSS color. And this is how Stellarium normally looks, if you see my image here. Um, and here's how it looks when you turn, well, when you turn on the deep sky color, 
It's called DSS color, actually. Now, let me see if I can get in here, come out here where it's a little bit better. Make it a little bit brighter for you. Okay. Can you see all that? Here's the difference. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if you're looking for deep sky targets and places to mosaic, did you, I, I, this is new to me, and and I swear I've looked for this, and I have never seen it. it maybe one of, you, one of you folks have seen it before. But I thought that is a cool tool to be able to see all that dust and hydrogen, and you can make out Orion here. Uh, and again, you just turn that off, and it really does make a big difference. So – I just thought that was a cool thing. I thought I'd share. I wanted. I meant to share it in the presentation, but I just forgot. Um, Matt, one other question: uh, How did you build your annotated uh, big image? Oh yeah. So once I put it together in PixInsight, uh, I plate solved it. It took it two days, but it plate solved. Okay, that's that was the question. I, I tried that. It, I didn't wait long enough. Okay. Yeah, it takes a long time and a lot of data. And and I would say this: um, I tried it several times. Um, Wherever you work on your data, you want to make sure that's a solid state drive for PixInsight so it can pull it straight from there and make sure you've got your swap drives in place. So my my build, my my thread ripping thread ripper system I built with 256 gigs of memory, I actually set up two solid state drives that are one terabyte each, and they each have 10 solid state um, swap drives on them. And then I have the solid state drive that the operating system's on. And then I have a solid state drive that the data goes to. And that just keeps that system nice and fast. And I early on, I tried it with a spinning disc in there. And it kept crashing. And I thought, you know, I bet it's a spinning disc. So I, I spent more, yet more money <laughs> and bought a solid state drive. And, uh, and it solved the problem. So the solid state drives being able to hit that data really nice and fast, really. Is that is that the process that was crashing this Mac Pro that uh, well, when you were running the, it on that? No, the Mac Pro was doing fine. It would the Mac Pro ran out of memory. Sixty four ah, okay. gigs of memory was not enough to put together a two hundred panel mosaic. Uh, it actually was going to need about one hundred and twenty five twenty six mega gigabytes, according right. to the guys at PixInsight. Okay. And can you adopt me? Because you're obviously rich. <laughs> I work in nonprofit, buddy. You know what that means? It means not for profit. <laughs> <laughs> and so does um, my <laughs> But I don't have any kids. So, yeah. <laughs> that's the great equalizer. Well, I guess I'm halfway there at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will say uh, thank you for having me. I am going to hop off here so I can go see my wife. Um, I hear so many great things about you guys. If there's ever anything the Chattanooga Astronomical Society can do for you, or if we could get together, maybe one day we might have, uh, I've dreamed that our society could put on a, uh, like a NEAF level presentation and, and show for the South. And, uh, and, and our society, we've got a hundred members in our society and um, about 3000 members online if you go by Facebook stuff. But um, we would love to do something like that. So if you guys ever think about that, we could hit up the guys at the Von Braun Astronomical Society uh, who are growing leaps and bounds and the folks over at the Cumberland Astronomy um, in, in Middle Tennessee and maybe maybe do something big like that. But I would love to love to do that with you guys. That's great. Eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, uh, so this will be recorded and we'll put it online. And, but yeah, we'll let the officers know about that. Yeah, that would be nice to do some collaboration. Never done that before. But. Very good. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, you guys have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Very nice. Uh, okay, well, uh, well, it's just us now. Uh, does anybody have any uh, material they'd like to present? Sure. Go for it. All right, let me find the right screen to share. Um, all right. So I added guiding to my rig since we last met and been overdoing it, I'm sure. Um, most of these are either five or 10 minute uh, subs, but M13 
which is really cool. Um, find out have a thing for globular clusters that just look amazing. So um, we'll see more of those as I keen in. Uh, really happy with this pinwheel. Um, I don't know that I'll go back and play with the, the colors anymore. It turned out, I think, pretty well for what I was, what I was trying to do. Um, I'm sorry, say again? For the optics and camera? Uh, I've got a, a Xenostar uh, 430 with uh, a Canon uh, Rebel SL2 uh, DSLR because my wife had one and I, <laughs> I haven't gotten anything better. Though so she's talked about wanting to take it back. So that's good. Well, there's no excuse to get something better then. Yeah. Oh, well, we just took a walk with the dogs. I'm like, ah, there's this one I want maybe. Uh, torn between getting a one shot color and a mono, but. Naveen, are you using a uh, UV or IR cut filter with these? Uh, it's a stock on modified DSLR, so whatever came in it. Okay. So that's the other thing I want to look at getting and something that will do uh, uh, Nebula justice pretty soon. So anyway, uh, this one was uh, not very much integration time, uh, Sombrero Galaxy. I caught it between my house and my neighbor's house for like, like just a couple hours, I think. Um, be fun to go back and get that, get some more sometime. Uh, this was so part of a, a group that does uh, single shot astrophotography images. So this is a single 20 minute sub of M3, which is uh, just fun. Uh, Crocs Eye Galaxy. I'll, this one was neat. Well, Galaxy, and I, I learned this is the the hockey stick galaxy on the other side. Yeah. Um, jellyfish Nebula is setting now, but we had the stretch of six, seven days. Well, I, I put the scope out for six days in a row and I was like, I'm just gonna try. So this again, unmodified DSLR, about an hour, a little bit more than an hour each night. So only six and a half hours total. Well, I mean, look at it this way. Uh, so I look at this, and uh, for uh, unmodified DSLR, I mean, it's not terrible, but uh, you know, you're talking about you didn't know if you want to get a mono or color. If if she's willing, you can just uh, use her hers to get what is uh, essentially uh, non narrow band wavelengths uh, with uh, that DSLR right there, and then just uh, combine a uh, monitor data and uh, pix insight, and there you go, bam. Uh, best of both worlds there. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. Uh, this is M106. Uh, neat little edge on galaxy in the bottom middle. I really have uh, another one of those things I'm finding I, I like. I need to get a scope that can actually get in there and see these types of things better, but someday. Um, the last one I've been playing around. So <laughs> I'm a site reliability engineer and my day job. And so I've set up monitoring and dashboards and alerts for the rig so I can sleep and be um, sane. Uh, so just a quick snapshot, of like showing the computer, like computer uh, CPU utilization, network traffic, you know, status of PHD2, what's the pulse guiding doing, how's the drift, quality of the image as reported by Nina, environmental stuff out of the, um, uh, power box and, and then the where have I been so it's a shot of the last 12 hours of points in the sky based on what the telescope is reporting there's a lot more data I've collected but that's what I've been able to get into a, a usable format so yeah that's it anybody else yeah I have some Chris if you want Go for it. Of course, I want. Uh, of course, you want. All right. Hang on. Uh, let's start out with. Let, let me get the screen share going here. Hang on. Uh, here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that showing up? That's great. All right. Uh, this is uh, a while back now, April 4th. 
uh, most of the, the targets are were pretty low in the sky, but I just decided to try them because I haven't done it in a while. This is about, uh, and it went a lot of hours to get on by the trees, about 100 minutes of the cone nebula or NHA. Uh, and then and then over the next couple of nights, I added oxygen and sulfur and ended up with that. Pretty psychedelic, but again, only about, a, about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes because that's all I could get on these things. But I said, well, I'm going to try it before I can't do it anymore for a few months. So that's that's the cone and the Christmas tree and all the other area. And then... Uh, Let's see, then I just, the other night I just pointed at the beehive cluster just to see what I could get. And what I like is just the, get these little galaxies in here that are sitting inside the beehive cluster. Never do that over there. Oh yeah, there's lots of little galaxies in this. Uh, here's, here's one here. If you look at it carefully, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing to try. This is two hours of exposure. Uh, and then, uh, let's see what else is in here. Sorry, a lot of other junk. And this one was a while back now. This is March 14th. I don't know if I think I've shown this before. Did I have, uh, 1893 and 410 and I got the little, find little tadpoles and things like that. This is two and a half hours and 10 minute exposures. Uh, I've given up on narrow band now and so I'm, Resetting things to do galaxies and that sort of thing, but that's kind of what what I've been working on in the past uh, month or six weeks or something like that. It's no, maybe, maybe you feel awkward. What is that Markarian image down there? It looks like a uh, almost like a sound wave, like a like scroll down a little bit. Yeah, that that guy right there, Markarian chain pixel sorting. What's that? Right, right. Right, that's uh, just some mathematical software that does an averaging of pixels across across lines in, a, in an astronomical image and gives you some notion of, of where the light is coming from across an image. Uh, and it's, and uh, then people use it like this one for artistic fiddling with images and whatnot. So in this case, it's averaging vertically across the Orion and you get these weird pseudo three-dimensional images uh, it's just like some software I was playing around with just to see what it would do. And you get some interesting stuff. There are other versions of it where you make 3D things that actually come out of the screen. It's kind of, kind of an amusing thing to play with. Okay. I mean, I guess that's all I've got. Anybody else? Hey, uh, Chris, I got one else, Joe. Go for it. Let's see. This one is kind of a new target for me. I got kind of lucky with this one. Um, Y'all recognize that one? Do you see it? No, I just see you right now. Oh, let me try this. How about now? Here we go. Okay. All right, so um, you guys recognize what that one is? A maybe three? Yep. Yeah, so... Uh, it's not one I had imaged before, and uh, thought, well, I'll give it a shot because it's a little while before my uh, next target comes up. And it just happened to be passing between some trees, and so I went and got it again the next night. So I was kind of happy to get that one. It was kind of a new one for me. You should be able to go after it right now, right? Uh, what was that again? You should be able to go after it right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Now's a really good time to get it. It's about as high as it gets. Right, that's uh, all I got. Okay, uh, anybody else? No? Uh, so uh, so uh, next month is, uh, we'll have uh, um, Steve Goodman uh, give us a rundown of how he created his last, uh, or not last, excuse me, I'm sure he's probably made more than one in the past because he's been in the club for a while. But uh, he's going to uh, uh, show us uh, how he uh, made his last scope uh, by um, grinding the mirrors and whatnot for for a new uh, that you've been using to uh, 
image with uh, Steve Goodman. He's imaged a little bit over the years, but it seems like uh, just recently he's got into it a little bit more. So that's what the uh, uh, May topic is going to be about, uh, showing you how he uh, built the scope and whatnot. But uh, uh, so beyond May, we don't really have much in the way of topics yet. But one thing I brainstormed about uh, today was uh, uh, maybe I don't know if it just crossed my mind because they had done it before or not, but uh, I thought that what we could do. Uh, uh, I have some other places I want to look for uh, topics, but one of the things that we could do is that uh, uh, everybody could like uh, show us what your, uh, you know, your favorite uh, scope or favorite uh, uh, focal length is and show us all the bells and wh whistles uh, are uh, that make it a great scope or a great setup. And uh, then show us some images that you uh, t have taken with it. Um, like, uh, for example, what I have over Back here at home, I have an SVR90T uh, stellar view, and uh, uh, well, in this uh, uh, scenario, it's fine. It's the scope I've owned the longest, so I've uh, gotten a lot of use out of it. And uh, like uh, over the past two years, I've just started using a focal reducer with it, reducer with it, and uh, I've been going almost completely off DSLR now. So it's up a lot of different possibilities and whatnot, but uh, that just gives you an example. So if you have a scope out there that you would like to show uh, what it can do, uh, that's one of the uh, ideas I have for a topic uh, a little later on. Uh, otherwise, uh, 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 Naveen is going to try to assist me with this to try to uh, find other topics to cover. But uh, Otherwise, if you do have a topic that you would like to present, the biggest thing that uh, I want to make sure that we get across is that you don't want to go into too much detail. And we'll try to keep your presentation about 45 minutes to an hour, 40, closer to 45 minutes, uh, the better. So uh, anyway, um, I guess other than that, does anybody have anything, have anything else to add? Am I missing anything, Mike? What's that, Chris? I said, does anybody else have anything else to add before we shut the uh, close the meeting? No. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And yeah, uh, thanks to Naveen for helping out with the uh, organizing the talks. Uh, I have a few workshops I want to work out. I'm talking with John Davis and a few other people. Um, if you have any ideas, obviously shoot it to Chris or Naveen or me and uh, either give us an idea for a talk or if you want to give one. Uh, we got so many great people doing images and stuff now. I think just about anybody ought to be able to give us a, a fun talk. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, don't need, you don't need to be shy or anything. Uh, it's pretty much the, the way Mike lays out his uh, uh, his uh, work, workshop. You get a drift of how, what a workshop is all about. It's all about getting gritty details. It's not just the presentation. So, uh, but a presentation is just, that's what you're doing, you're presenting. And uh, of course, the yeah, side effect is you're entertaining everybody. So. Anyway, okay. Uh, I guess that will uh, leave it at that. Uh, anybody else have anything else to add? I'll just say, I thought Matt did a good job of taking a complicated thing and kind of just showing a, a good level presentation, what we're talking about for a presentation. Um, he went into some details, but mostly it was the showing of the fun stuff he did and, and how it came together. So I think that's what we're targeting. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, hopefully anybody who else sees this recording has got uh, I guess when it comes to trying to organize uh, uh, topics to be presented, that's what you want to drive home. You want to make uh, get down to the point and, uh, you know, and, well, I guess the best way I could say is, like I said earlier, just entertain us. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we're not, we're not out here trying to like, oh, well, here's how I made this mosaic. And you got to do this, you got to do that. No, I mean, he told us the whole journey. That, that's what it's all about, having fun in your hobby. Okay, uh, I guess we'll uh, leave it at that and uh, we'll see you next month. All right, good night. All right, good night. See you later. Yeah. Bye.